the collect for the sixth Sunday after Trinity. O God, who has prepared for them that love thee such good things as past man's understanding, pour into our hearts such love toward thee that we, loving thee above all things, may obtain thy promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 552, 1 and 2. Fight the good fight with all thy might. Christ is thy strength and Christ thy right. Lay hold on life and it shall be thy joy and crown eternally. Run the straight race through God's good grace. Lift up thine eyes and seek his face. With its way before us lies. Christ is the path, and Christ the prize. Well, we return to this continuing saga of Dr. Thomas Cranmer with the caveat that Prof. Ridley does not do much by way of theology, systematic theology, Old or New Testament exegesis, even historically, as if we're studying church history, but he doesn't do much by way of a broader compass or reference, and very little by way of practical or contemporary theology. Now, the objection to our objection is a man can't do everything, to which we respond, true. He can't do everything, but our objection to the objection to the objection is that if a man is controlled and informed by those things, it's impossible to hide them. Whatever is a light in a man's life is going to come out here or there. So something is amiss here in our study. We've got a bug flying around again. Back to Prof. Jasper. Cranmer's, and we just finished that letter. <laughs> on 3 May with a uh, appended final paragraph after Cranmer had been brought into the Privy Council Star Chamber and heard the case against Anne. He puts on another paragraph. But the letter is really a weirdo one. Cranmer's critics have suggested that he was guilty of cowardice in writing this letter because he did not to make a stronger plea for Anne. But this view is quite unjustified. Almost every other courtier in his position would have hastened to denounce Anne and to obscure the fact that it was Anne to whom he owed his promotion. But Cranmer made no attempt to do this, though he, who actually crowned Anne, managed to insert a passage in his letter in which he mentioned that it was Henry alone who set the crown upon her head. His statement that if Anne were guilty, she deserved punishment was the least which he could say. And if his exhortation to Henry to emulate Job was sadly out of place, according to Chapuy, you never saw a prince nor a man who made greater show of his horns or bore them more lightheartedly. Chapuy to Granville. 1819, May 1536. Which prince is he talking about? Is he talking about Tom Cranmer? The antecedent is not clear. Maybe it's Henry. It sounds like it's Henry. Cranmer did not know <clears throat> when he wrote the letter <clears throat> of the shameless rejoicing in which Henry would indulge during the next three weeks. It is, however, equally wrong to interpret the letter as an attempt to save Anne. Cranmer's Anne aim was not to save the Queen, but to save the Reformation. We would interject that we think he's confused a little bit, doesn't know what to say, except steer a middle road that pleases Henry and the courtiers. And he's willing to go along to get along. When Cranmer heard of Anne's arrest, it obviously occurred to him, as it did to almost everyone else, that it marked a reversal in Henry's policy, a repudiation of the Reformation, 
with which Anne had been closely associated. The news was received with joy by the papists. P.O. to Ambrogio, 19 May 1536. Chapuis, our faithful Spanish uh, retailer of gossip and street talk, often quite right, to Granville. 18, 19 May, Granville was an English ambassador on the continent, as memory serves. The Pope and Poles suspended all their propaganda and intrigues against Henry while they hopefully awaited his approaches for a reunion with Rome. Good luck for that. They confidently expected that Cranmer would fall with Anne. I'm so glad that we're doing our criminal studies on the law of homicide. We see malice aforethought. Not presumed malice, explicit and expressed malice. The papal nuncio in France had heard by the 19th of May that Henry had changed his religious policy and had called a halt to the suppression of the monasteries while Cranmer was supposed to have fled from London but to have been brought back at Henry's orders. Chapuy wrote to Granville from London on the same day that the reforming bishops were doomed. So this is all 1536. Cranmer's a known man, marked man. There's reforming bishops that are known and marked. But he doesn't tell us what it is. This is just not good. What is a reforming bishop? Are we supposed to know? Are we supposed to have a crystal ball around Prof Ridley's brain? And mentioned the rumor, which even he stated might well be without foundation, that these bishops had incited Anne to commit adultery by telling her that there was no need to go to confession and that according to the Lutheran doctrine, she was entitled to commit incest if her husband could not satisfy her. It is typical of Cranmer that at this hour, he thought neither of saving himself nor of saving Anne, but saving only the Reformation. He wrote to Henry to persuade him to adhere to the policy of the Reformation, even if he sacrificed the woman who had first led him to adopt this policy. That's overstated. Cranmer was his own man theologically, is what we would assume. He was not beholden to Anne on doctrine, but it's an interesting suggestion which the prof makes. But Henry had no intention of abandoning the Reformation or of destroying Cranmer. The animal sacrifice, not in order to end the schism from Rome, but in the interests of improved relations with the emperor. Since the death of Catherine of Aragon, this no longer involved the repudiation of the divorce and Cranmer's judgment at Dunstable, what we call the 30-day wonder. The 30-day boom, boom. Catherine out, hands in. Anne's crown, six months pregnant. <laughs> Story. Anne was sacrificed. Okay, we read that. <clears throat> the foreign papists were wrong in thinking that Cranmer was in danger. His modern biographers have stressed the danger in which Cranmer stood at this time. But the contemporary writers, Maurice, Fox, Parker, Aless, and the anonymous biographer do not mention the fall of Anne Boleyn as one of the occasions on which Cranmer was threatened. They refer to his perilous position at the, at the time of the enactment of the six articles, we would agree, at Cromwell's fall and at the time of the Probendary's plot in 1543 and the conspiracy against him in the council. But none of them suggests another such occasion 
was in May 1536. So six articles, 1539, Cromwell, 1540, Probendary's plot, 1543, and then that gig they had against him with the council, what was the date on that? But Cranmer had a target on his back. Cranmer remained in office and in favor, and Henry maintained the Reformation as Cranmer had urged him to do. But this meant that Cranmer had to play his part in the proceedings against Anne. He did this, not because he was afraid of the consequences to himself if he refused, or as the price of his own survival, but because as long as he was Archbishop of Canterbury, the duty of acting in such matters fell to him, just as it was the duty of Norfolk and other peers to perform their roles in the case. Uh, he's cutting him too much slack, we think. On 15th May, Anne was convicted of high treason and sentenced to death. She strongly protested her innocence. Next day, Cranmer visited her in the tower. The constable of the tower, Sir William Kinston, had been informed by Henry that Cranmer had been appointed as Anne's confessor and was to have free access to her. On the day when Cranmer visited her, Anne told Kinston at dinner that she would be sent to a nunnery. She was very hopeful that her life would be spared. On the basis of this evidence, Cranmer's critics have often accused him of having promised Anne at this interview that she would not be executed if she provided the evidence necessary for him to declare that her marriage to Henry had been invalid, although he knew that he was deceiving her when he made this promise. But this is unlikely. Henry had no need to deceive Anne with false promises of life in order to gain her assistance. For as the sentence of the court was that Anne should be either burned or beheaded at the king's pleasure, he had only to tell Cranmer to promise the easier death if she complied with his wishes. In any case, it is rarely necessary for the authorities to make any promises to condemn prisoners in order to obtain their cooperation. Cranmer may have hinted to Anne that the divorce was the only chance of saving her life but he is unlikely to have done more. And again, that's an opinion. Anne's mood alternated during her imprisonment between utter despair and the wildest hopes. That her optimism at dinner on 16 May cannot necessarily be attributed to what Cranmer had just told her. In fact, we cannot even be sure that she had already spoken with him for we do not know whether Cranmer's visit to Anne on the 16th was in the morning or in the afternoon. Kinston to Cromwell, 16 May, 1536, where in the passage, quote, this day at dinner the queen said she should go to a nunnery and is in hope of life. The words a nunnery are printed on Urvis and interpreted as meaning Antwerp. And it's Cranmer's sentence of divorce, 17 May, 1536 visits or 16 May, 17 divorce, records of convocation, June, July, 1536. He played his part all right. The decision to divorce Anne 24 hours before beheading her, thereby sending to her death with the knowledge that Elizabeth was bastardized, has been severely condemned by modern writers. But it was a shrewd political move for Henry to invalidate for different reasons, a, mar a marriage which his enemies proclaimed to be invalid and to bastardize a princess, princess who was regarded as a bastard by at least half a nation. And nearly every foreign government can't make this stuff up. It is difficult to believe that Cranmer was able to convince himself that there was any other motive behind the divorce proceedings. At nine o'clock in the morning, 17th May, he opened his court at Lambeth. 
I would love to be in the room, look around where that allegedly happened at Lambeth last time I was there. I walked by it, didn't get into it. I was too much going on that day. No one was admitted except the proctors for Henry and Anne and a few of the lords of the council. The matter was urgent, as Anne's execution, which had been fixed for the 17th, was postponed for only 48 hours in order to enable Cranmer to pass his sentence before she was beheaded. The proceedings were completed by 11 o'clock. Cranmer gave judgment that the marriage between Henry and Anne was a nullity. His judgment gives no indication of the grounds for his decision, which is not surprising, for the reasons were never given in the formal judgments. But it is certainly remarkable that there is no surviving record of any kind as to the reasons for divorce. There were three rumors circulating in London within a few days of the divorce. The first, which was certainly untrue, was that Cranmer had given judgment that Elizabeth was the child of Norris. The second was that he had pronounced, and that's obviously false. The second was that he had pronounced the marriage to be void on account of Anne's pre-contract with the Earl of North Northumberland. And third, that he had done so on grounds that Henry's adultery with Anne's sister was a bar to marrying Anne and invalidated the ma marriage. Historians today are still divided as to whether the pre-contract with Northumberland or Henry's misconduct with Mary Boleyn was the grounds for Cranmer's decree, but it was almost certainly Henry's misconduct with Mary. He knew that when he married Anne. He knew it well enough. He knew all this. This is Henry and his Bubba's doing Henry's bidding. It would obviously have been preferable to have chosen the pre-contract as the grounds, but rather than find a reason which was so discreditable to the king, but there were difficulties about adopting this course. Four years before, Northumberland had sworn an oath before Warham and had received the sacrament before Norfolk, that he was not pre-contracted to Anne, and he now hastened to write to Cromwell on the 13th of May to remind him of this. Northumberland, having denied the existence of the pre-contract in 1532 in order to make it possible for Henry to marry Anne, could not now retract his denial without placing himself in an even more dangerous position than if he angered the king by refusing to retract it. Chapuy to Granville, 18, 19 May, 8 July, 1536, Rye Othsley, Northumberland to Cromwell, 13 May, 1536. The chief evidence for the view that the pre, we're in a footnote, the cot was a Chief evidence for the view that the pre-contract was the ground for the divorce is his statement in the Acts of Succession in 1536, 28 Henry 8, C8, that the marriage was declared void because of certain impediments confessed by Anne to Cranmer when he was sitting judicially. But apart from this obvious unreliability of the statement, it may have meant no more that Anne, through her proctors, had admitted at the trial at Lambeth that Henry was entitled to a divorce. There was another difficulty about basing the divorce on the grounds of the pre-contract. The purpose of annulling the marriage was to bastardize Elizabeth. But even if the marriage were unlawful, Elizabeth would be legitimate under the canon law, even if one of her parents had believed that the marriage was valid and had therefore been in good faith at the time of her birth. It would have been difficult for Henry to deny that he had been in good faith as far as the pre-contract was concerned, for he could hardly have said that he had known about the pre-contract when he married Anne, in view of the fact that it had been officially declared before the marriage, after a public investigation, that there had been no pre-contract. 
it was very far easier to hold that both Henry and Anne had known that Mary Boleyn had been Henry's mistress and to base the absence of good faith and Elizabeth's bastardy on these grounds. The strongest evidence that Henry's misconduct was the grounds for the door of divorce is the fact that in the new act of succession in July 1536, a mere few months later, which recited the nullity of Henry's marriage to Anne, it was expressly enacted that a marriage of a man to the sister of his mistress was void as being within the prohibited degrees. Sounds like a CYA action. This had not been included in the prohibited decrees laid down in the Act of Succession in 1533. How are we doing here? But in choosing this thoroughly undesirable reason for his decision, Cranmer faced another difficulty. In 1527, when Henry first decided that he wished to marry Anne, he had obtained from the Pope a dispensation permitting him to marry any woman in contravention of the bar of affinity, including the sister of his mistress, provided only that he might not marry his brother's widow. In marrying Anne, Henry had relied on both the invalidity of the papal dispensation of 1503 which had permitted him to marry Catherine, and on the validity of the papal dispensation of 1527. This position was only tenable on the grounds that in 1503, the Pope had wrongly purported to dispense with divine law, whereas in 1527, he merely dispensed with a canonical bar. The dispensation of 1527 was now an obstacle to the divorce in 1536. It could have been surmounted by holding that a man's marriage to the sister of his mistress, as well as a marriage to the sister of his wife, was unlawful by divine law. But this had never been asserted by any theologian and was expressly repudiated in one of the pamphlets written in connection with Henry's divorce from Catherine pamphlet which may even have been written by Cranmer himself. Cranmer probably resolved the problem by holding that the Act of Dispensations of 1534 had invalidated all papal dispensations retrospectively as well as for the future. It was obviously because this difficulty had arisen that a statute of 15 July 1536 enacted that no dispensation had at any time been granted by the Pope it was valid unless it had been confirmed by the Lord Chancellor. Whatever the grounds for the divorce may have been, there were enough legal complexities to make it impossible to dispose of the case in two hours if there had been a fair and proper trial. It is clear that Anne's proctors made no real attempt to argue against the divorce and that Cranmer made short shrift of all the legal difficulties. It was obviously desirable to prevent it from being publicly known that the grounds of the divorce was Henry's misconduct with Mary Boleyn. Presumably no indication of the grounds was given to convocation in June when both houses unanimously approved Cranmer's sentence of divorce. That was nullity. Since it's a divorce. If the members present who numbered more than a hundred were informed as to the reasons, they preserved the secret surprisingly well. It is more likely that they were sufficiently servile to approve the divorce without knowing the grounds for the decision, relying merely on the assurance that when Cranmer gave his judgment, he had God alone before his eyes. Ac ipsum solum deum pri oculos nostris habentis. Cranmer's sentence of divorce, 17 May 13, 1536. <coughs> yeah, God before my eyes and also Henry. Poor Cranmer. Cranmer was chosen to be Anne Boleyn's confessor. He did not take her confession when he visited her on the 16th. Yeah, he's going to hang her the next day. What did he do? 
It's often suggested that on this occasion he used his position as a confessor to extract from Anne the admissions which he needed for the divorce proceedings the next day. But it is very unlikely that he would have committed this grave impropriety or that even Henry or Cromwell would have urged him to do so. On 18 May, Kinston wrote to Cromwell that he had not yet heard anything from Cranmer and that the Queen greatly desired to be shriven. We may therefore presume that Cranmer visited Anne again late on the 18th to hear her confession. He was not present at her execution the next morning. If Aunt, Cr Aunt Cranmer heard Anne's last confession, he was in a position where he could form a better opinion than any other person as to her innocence or guilt. Anne was, a was as religious as most of her contemporaries, and this aspect of her character has been accentuated during her imprisonment. Despite all the rumors which were circulating among the enemies, there is no reason to doubt that both Anne and Cranmer held, held the practice of confession in high esteem. If Anne affirmed her innocence in her final confession to Cranmer, he could be confident that she was speaking the truth. Cranford was therefore the only surviving purpose person with sure knowledge as to whether Anne had committed adultery and had wished to kill the king. It is this which gives such interest to the story which the Scottish reformer Aless told in his letter to Elizabeth I in 1559. Aless had come to England on the invitation of Cromwell and Cranmer and was in London at the time of Anne's death. On the morning of the 19th, 1536, he awoke from a dream at the first light between two and three o'clock, having dreamed that he had seen in gruesome detail the severed head of Anne Boleyn. As he was unable to sleep again after this experience, he rose across the river to Lambeth on arriving there just before four o'clock, he found Cranmer walking in the garden and told him about his horrible dream. Cranmer remained silent for a little while and then asked, Do you not know what is to happen today? Alas, had not left his house for some days and had not heard any news. Cranmer then raised his eyes to heaven and said, She who has been the Queen of England upon earth will today become a queen in heaven. He was too overcome with grief to say more and burst into tears. Alice, Alice to Elizabeth I, 1 September 1559, calendar of four foreign papers, Elizabeth I, 1303, page 528. Well, here we will end the continuing saga. What did Cranmer know that day before she lost her life? Verse 3 and 4. Cast care aside, lean on thy guide, his boundless mercy will provide. Trust in thy trusting soul shall prove Christ is its life and Christ its love. Verse 4. Faint, not fear, nor fear. <clears throat> his arms are near. He changeth not, and thou art dear. Only believe, and thou shalt see that Christ is all in all to thee. Let us pray. May the glory and honor be to you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Until next time, Godspeed.